everybody. Welcome back to Crime Weekly. I'm Stephanie Harlow. And I'm Derek Lavasser. So today we're diving into the second and final part of the Crystal Rogers case. But first, Derek says we have to talk about some other things. I definitely think we do. Yeah. Especially the second thing. Which, yes. you guys, if you watch Crime Weekly News, if you haven't, go check it out. It's on audio and video. You probably already know what we're about to say. But this is for the people who don't watch Crime Weekly News or crime we- or listen to it. So first thing, criminal coffee. A lot of you have been expressing the cost of the coffee to ship it to you is expensive. We agree. Mm-hmm. We mm-hmm. agree. That's USPS. We make zero dollars, zero cents off the shipping. So that's what USPS has us to. So Yo, the amount of shipping makes zero sense. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my God, it's one of those nights, guys. So we're so what we're trying to do is a lot of you have been DMing us saying, hey, listen, I'm local. Can I just come by and pick it up? We can't do that. It's just not practical. So what we're going to offer is this new pilot program where if you live within a 15-mile radius of Criminal Coffee, which is located in Providence, Rhode Island, it'll automatically detect that when you go to checkout. So if you're in Rhode Island or Southern Mass, it'll automatically detect that and it'll allow you to select local delivery. It's going to be $3.00. No matter what you order, you can order one bag of coffee, which is still cheaper than USPS, or you can order 50 bags of coffee. Doesn't matter. Flat rate, it's three bucks. So you can save a lot of money if you're local to this and you can just order it. We'll deliver it within the week right to your doorstep. And also, we want to spread the word about coffee and get it and get it into more hands, more criminal coffee customers. And some of you may not be directly wanting to purchase it or have it shipped to your house. So what we'd like to do is if you have a cafe near your home and it's someone you go to often and they're not selling their own, you know, special blend of coffee that's proprietary to them, see if they're open to the idea of carrying criminal coffee there. We would deliver it on our local delivery route. We'd have a little, st- you know, shelf set up in there. We'd have all the blends and you could go right in there. You could pick up the coffee with no shipping and anybody in your community could pick it up as well. So you could really help us expand our reach uh, locally first. And then if this pilot program goes really well, maybe we'll expand it regionally. We'll see how it goes. And if you are someone who reaches out to a cafe and something does come from it, Stephanie and I will come up with a nice little gift to say thank you if you're one of those people. We don't know what it is yet, but we'll figure it out. So that was the business side of things. But speaking of criminal coffee and what the whole purpose of this is, uh, we do have an announcement with it. Big news coming up. Stephanie's going to tell you about it. So remember that when you purchase something from Criminal Coffee, as far as coffee goes, K-cups or bags of coffee, a portion of the proceeds goes towards fighting crime. And our current fighting crime case was the case of Prabal Penny, which was a body that was found unidentified. We really didn't know who this person was, how they died. Old case. And this is out of Prabal County, Ohio. So because um, I think a great amount of the fact that we donated money forensically to kind of get to the bottom of who this person was, they have solved it. At least they they figured out who this person was, which I think is awesome because it's uh, it's very cool to think that all of us together are doing something that's having an impact in the real world and having an impact on real people. Like this person probably has a family out there. Maybe those people have been wondering what happened to them, uh, where they were. Maybe this person was the victim of a violent crime and now this case can be solved. But either way, they have their identity back and they're going to do a press conference in Preble County on November 17th. Derek and I were invited to be there, but because of the holidays, it's just so busy. Uh, We both have a lot going on. We could not make it. But if they stream it, we will get on a live so we can all watch together and discuss it and just, you know, take a moment to be, you know, happy and grateful that something we all were a part of has come to fruition. It's an amazing, beautiful thing. That's right. It's huge. And it's it's big for us because that's the whole reason we started Criminal Coffee was to help fund these cases that needed the funding. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it wouldn't be possible without you guys. And I said it on Crime Weekly News. I'll say it again here. You may have purchased one bag of coffee or K-Cups six months ago, a year ago, two, whenever we started. There, You were a small contributor to this case. Without you, it wouldn't have happened because this case was mostly solved by DNA. That's why they needed the funding. So uh, we don't want to spoil any of it. We're not going to tell you anything about the case now. We're going to save that for the press conference. But what I will tell you is there's a twist in this case like you wouldn't believe. I promise you I'm not just... 
selling you down the road and it's like, oh, that wasn't, it's crazy. And it'll selling explain you why down it took, the road, huh? Yeah, and it's, 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 it's also, it will explain why it took so long for this case. So um, why it was difficult. Yeah. Yep. There was a lot of trials and tribulations in this case. It was not easy. A lot of hard work went into it. So wouldn't have been possible without you guys. So I hope you will join us. We will actually have another audio episode coming out the day of this press conference, but put a reminder in your phone right now. We will definitely post it on social media. If there's a stream, what time it will be, we will be there and we'll watch it together. So again, thank you everybody who support us. I know sometimes we talk about criminal coffee a lot on this podcast and some of you are a little annoyed by it, but it's our baby. It's something that we're passionate about. We're giving back to the, to some of the cases that we talk about. That's the reason for it. So we don't mind pissing you off a little bit to do it because it's super good coffee. It's, it's super good coffee and it's for an even better reason. So thank you to everybody. This is positive news. We're making a difference. We're drinking good coffee and we're just getting started. So we're excited. Yeah. So now we can dive into our main episode. We can. Crystal Rogers part two. Everyone was all bummed. They were like, oh, this is that case is awesome. We want to hear the rest right now. Everyone mm-hmm. was hitting us up on social media like, I really don't know what to do with myself this week, not recording. <laughs> and I will acknowledge I was a little lost as well. Were you? I was not, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're always lost. So it's just like I know. So it just feels normal. State. Like, but like, like I I posted a video today, I think, and everyone was like, oh, my God, thank you so much for still doing something during your break. And I was like, I did not have a break. <laughs> no, same here. I mean, we that was just like, yeah, right. We didn't have crime weekly, but yeah. there was plenty to fill my days with. <laughs> yeah. I still put out an episode of Detective Perspective. I still record a crime feed. Like, yeah, we, it was just one week and it was because we had to like contractually, mm-hmm. we have to take the two weeks off a year and we're like, oh shit, that's, that's one of the weeks we picked. And I think the other yeah. ones in around Christmas. Christmas. Yeah. So it was, <laughs> we didn't even know. We're like, I was like, oh, we don't have to film next week. It's our blackout week. And, yeah, and yeah. I was like, thank God, because that was on the tail end of Halloween, and I had so much to do, and it really did help me. Yeah. Finish well, now up, we're so. back. We're energized. We're, we're ready back. to go. Yeah. Let's get into this episode. I'm going to try not to spoil too much, although this is the final part, so it's all coming out tonight. Yeah. Spoil away. Spoil away. Okay, <laughs> so, let's get into it. I'll do a quick recap of the case since it has been a week, since what you've heard from us and since you've heard from this case. On July 3rd, 2015, 35-year-old mother of five, Crystal Rogers, disappeared from Bardstown, Kentucky, where she was living with her children and her boyfriend, Brooks Houks, who was also the last person to see her before she went missing. On July 5th, Crystal's maroon 2007 Chevy Impala was found abandoned at mile marker 14 on the Bluegrass Parkway. Crystal's car keys, her purse, and her cell phone were all found in the vehicle, and although her tire was a little flat, it would not have been impossible for her to drive the car, and the positioning of the driver's seat seemed suspicious to those who knew Crystal best. The suspicion increased when Crystal's family found out that her boyfriend had not reported her missing, even though he had allegedly woken up on the morning of July 4th to not find Crystal in bed next to him. On July 8th, Brooks Houck was interviewed at the Nelson County Sheriff's Office by Detective John Snow. And during this conversation, Brooks informed the detective that he, Crystal, and their two-year-old son, Eli, had spent the evening of July 3rd on his family farm, a 245-acre piece of land located on Pascal Ballard Lane, which is about nine miles south of downtown Bardstown. He said that they arrived around 7.20 p.m. and they left to go home at five minutes after midnight. As soon as they got home, Brooke said he went to bed, leaving Crystal and their son awake. And the next morning when he got up, Eli was next to him in bed, but Crystal was not there. During this interview, Brooks got a call from his brother, Nick Houck, who was a Bardstown police officer. And Nick seemed highly agitated by Brooks still being at the police station and being interviewed by Detective Jon Snow. And when Brooks got off the phone, he informed Detective Jon Snow, basically, like, my brother thinks that you guys are trying to F me over. Like, you're you're trying to catch me up in something. And maybe I should leave. Within hours of Brooks leaving the sheriff's office, he and his brother, Nick, were pulling into the Houck family farm, and they remained there for a few hours before leaving at the same time. Now, all of this led to Nick Houck being side-eyed and him being brought in for an interview with the Kentucky State Police. When asked what he and Brooks had talked about at the family farm the night of Brooks's police interview, Nick said he couldn't remember what he and his brother had talked about, and he claimed they had not planned to meet out there even though they'd arrived and left simultaneously. 
Now, Nick was ordered to have a polygraph administered by the FBI, which he failed. We all got a good laugh about how he reacted during <laughs> during that polygraph when the uh, yeah, you FBI loved the polygrapher, loved him. You know, he's like, why are you getting so angry? Love Detective you know? John Snow. Love him. Yeah. Nick Houck, not such a big fan of Detective Jon Snow, apparently. No. Although I think that was just an excuse for why he called and told his brother to leave. I don't think he has any problem with Detective Jon Snow. I don't think that Detective Jon Snow has some weird or nefarious reputation. I think Nick just needed a reason of why you know, he w- wanted. I, I will say that it's, it's interesting you bring that part up because when he said that, and me being someone who's worked on the inside, they didn't really push back on it. He, and he was like, you know, you guys know. So I, I will say this, not that it means anything in this case. Like we, we, we're going over the facts of this case and it only, it only builds from here. But I will just acknowledge this. There could be something because of the, the way these towns are and how they're connected. Maybe Detective Snow had something happen in his past that, again, it might have been a one off or whatever, but something that multiple agencies knew about involving him. And that's what he was referring to because I found it interesting because I would have said if I'm the, those, those detectives, especially knowing it's being recorded, I'm going to look at that statement as something he's trying to set up for future use with a lawyer. And I would have questioned him on it. Well, what do you mean by that? If I didn't already know, I would have said, well, what do you, what do you wait? Hold on a well, second. We didn't, we didn't hear the whole thing. They could have done that. You know, we don't know. It wasn't clipped right there though. They just let him keep talking. So I, you're right. We didn't hear the whole thing, but I will say just looking at that video, I would have stopped him right there and not let him just drop that grenade and run. I would have said, whoa, 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 stop for a second. What are you referring to? What do we know about Jon Snow that, you know, you know what he's done? What? Uh, the only reason I could think they wouldn't is if they did know what he was talking about. And that's just a guess on my part. I'm not trying to discredit this guy, this detective. I don't know him. But I didn't mention it last episode because we were dissecting so much. But I'm glad you brought it up tonight because I know we're joking about the name Jon Snow and all this stuff. I know you're not really that invested into him other than his name. I mean, but I kind of am, but I, well, that's I, weird. That's yeah, a, that's. A I mean, story. I think he was. I think he, like because he he was very invested in this case, right? So he's always on the scene up until 2019. That's when a new detective took over. John, yeah. Detective Jon Snow was like boots on the ground with well, his ad research. Yeah. But, but I, I just, think he, I think he also felt almost like once he had sat down in front of Brooks Houck and heard this dude and, and the, the allegedly the garbage that he was spewing, I think Detective John Snow knew he was like, I'm sitting in front of somebody that definitely had something to do with. This oh, the math wasn't mathing. Yeah, the math wasn't mathing. So, but and I don't want to make it like this big drawn out thing. But I'm glad you brought it up because that was something I had in my notes. Like, whoa, that was interesting that he threw that out there and he said it as almost if like you guys know. You know what I mean? Like he didn't say like, I heard some stuff from my people that I, you know, made me concerned about him. He just said, you guys, he, I don't know the exact words, but he made it seem like everyone was aware of it, which I found interesting. And I will, I'll acknowledge this as the cop on the show, not all cops are good cops. Sometimes they do bad things. Sometimes they're good cops that do bad things because they think they're doing it for the right reason. And whatever way you slice it. There, we do have to have this checks and balances because we want to make sure that when these cases go to court, they're 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 heard the way they should be heard, and there's no sidetrack there because of something the police officer or the detective did during the investigation that derails the prosecution's case, which we've seen before. So, it's just an interesting little side note. I don't know if there's anything to it. I will tell you, if there is something to it, you got to bet your whatever money you have on you that Brooks's attorney. We'll be bringing that up if there's yeah, something. I couldn't really find documented. anything. Apparently, Brooks had said something like Detective Jon Snow had lied under oath or something. Gig- but like, g- if he had a Giglio on him, not good. But honestly, not- like, we got to consider the source, man. Like, I is get Nick Houck somebody that we're going to listen to when we're talking about like moral fiber and the values of being a police officer? Oh no, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not taking you their know? word for it. I'm just saying when we're talking about this case going forward, trial. We may be covering it again. And this is something that all of you have to make a note of. What was this? Was this a, just a red herring? Or is there something to this? Because I can promise you defense attorneys will be looking at Jon Snow's jacket. He'll be looking at it because if the case is that strong, they're going to have to go after the source, right? They're going to have to go after the investigators, the forensic people. They're going to have to go after the experts on the case because they only have to convince one jury member. 
right? So this may be something, it may be nothing, but I think it's important for us to bring up because it already felt like Nick was already setting it up where he's like, you know, the guy at the, you know, the captain of this ship is not a good guy. That's what I yeah, thought. Yeah, I don't think there's anything to it, honestly. We I can't find, find anything. And it might be internal. You might not find out about it. And that's what I'm saying. It could be something internally that was done from an IA or something like that that wasn't criminal in nature. I'll be interested to see if there's anything to it. And if we don't hear about it at trial, that gives you your answer. That means whatever he's talking about, there was nothing because I'm assuming he's going to have a high-powered attorney. They've got money. So he's going to have someone who's going to turn over some stones. You may have your boy Jose Baez there. Just saying. I think Jose Baez, I think his, I, I don't think he's working actively anymore. Let he's me on a case say. right now. What case is it? It's that case out of Jacksonville with the the husband that was killed by the ex-wife or whatever, uh, Brigadin or something. I'm not, I don't know if I'm saying it right, but he's definitely on, he's in the news right now for this. And I guess it's another tough case for him, but, uh, but yeah, he's still actively working. Not that I think he's going to work this case. Just- well, we'll keep an eye on that case then. Sheena Gardner and her current husband, 34-year-old Mario Fernandez, they're both facing charges of first-degree murder. Gardner That's the was one he's arrested working right in now. August. Oh, damn. Look at him. Look at him. Yep. He's out there. <laughs> he's <laughs> he's representing a guilty person again. Yikes. Allegedly. 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 <laughs> Jesus. Allegedly. Trying to get those murderers off. <laughs> Allegedly. Really do, doing a lot of good for the world, you know? <laughs> Whatever. I hate him. Anyways, all of this stuff. Nick Houck calling his brother during the police interview, Nick being involved, being at the family farm the night of the police interview, being sketchy during his interview with the Kentucky State Police, having memory loss. He didn't know what he was there for. He couldn't remember talking to him. He didn't know this. He didn't know that. And then his failed polygraph and his behavior when he failed the polygraph. All of this led to Nick being eventually fired from the Bardstown Police Department because his actions had brought a stain of dishonor onto the city and the entire police department. Now, this was all revealed to the public the following October, at which time Sheriff Ed Mattingly also announced for the first time that he and his department did not believe that Crystal Rogers was still alive and her boyfriend, Brooks Hauk, was officially a suspect in whatever tragedy had befallen her. Mattingly also said that he believed Nick Hauk knew what had happened, saying, quote, I have eight pages of circumstances that lead me to look in their direction. Yes, end quote. Damn, there we are. Let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. You guys already know that I love Skims. It all started with their Fits Everybody collection of the butteriest, softest underwear ever, so I wanted to try more from the brand. I'm always seeing their cotton loungewear all over my social media feeds, so I had to find out for myself what all the hype was about, and let me tell you, they did not disappoint. These are the cutest and most flattering sets you'll find for in or out of the house. Skims is creating the next generation of loungewear for every body. I love the cotton collection. Uh, The loungewear is amazing. They really do mean it when they say you can wear these inside or out of the house because they fit beautifully. They cover up so you're not, you know, it's not see-through. It's comfortable. It's warm. Perfect to sleep in. Perfect to run errands in. I love, love this collection. I tried the cotton t-shirt from Skims. Uh, It's the best t-shirt I've ever owned. I really love the cotton rib leggings. I have them in probably four different colors right now. I have the kyanite, the mineral, black, gray. I love them. The boxers, the cotton rib boxers are also amazing. And the cotton jersey uh, scoop bralette, super comfortable. And then when you have all of these things on together and you're mixing or matching or you're complementing the colors together, it just looks so put together, so classic, and you feel comfortable at the same time. And the cotton collection is Skim's most tagged collection. It's made with classic cotton fabric for comfortable everyday wear, and it's made from ultra soft and natural fibers. So the cotton collection features elevated lounge pieces designed for comfort indoors and outside. And these are available in sizes extra, extra small to 4X. I love skims. I have their amazing dress. I have their body suits, the cotton collection, everything. The Fits Everybody collection. We just love Skims here. And Derek's going to tell you how you can check them out for yourself. That's right. Believe the hype. Skims has over 100,000 five-star reviews for a reason. The cotton collection and more are available now at skims.com. 
Plus, get free shipping on orders over $75. And if you haven't yet, be sure to let them know that we sent you. After you place your order, select podcast in the survey and select our show in the drop down menu. And if you missed the big news, Skims reinvented underwear for women and now they're doing it for men as well. And it's all available at skims.com. So during the time that all of this was going on, Crystal's parents, Sherry and Tommy Ballard, they started the process of trying to gain custody of Eli, the two-year-old son that Crystal shared with Brooks Houck. In August of 2016, the Ballards saw Brooks for the first time since they had reported their daughter missing. After the court hearing, Tommy Ballard said, quote, he made eye contact with me. I made eye contact with him. I just want to see my grandson. I'm not worried about nobody but my grandson and my daughter, end quote. The Ballards would continue to fight for Eli, but before their court date was scheduled, an arrest was made in connection with Crystal's disappearance. On December 16, 2015, a man named Danny Singleton was arrested and charged with 38 counts of perjury for lying to investigators while under oath. Now, Singleton was an employee of Brooks Houck. He was also described as Brooks' right-hand man, and he'd been the one who had called Brooks early the morning of July 4th. Remember, Detective John Snow was like, well, it's a Saturday. Um, It's July 4th. You're not working. Why is somebody calling you like before 7 a.m.? Why would somebody who worked for you call you before 7 a.m.? And Brooks was like, you know, his his normal narrative, like, well, I'm so busy and so important. And my apartment smells of rich mahogany and I have many leather bound books. And, you know, just people call me all the time. And don't there's always bring Ron Burgundy to do. into this. Do not do that, <laughs> first and foremost. But you can continue now. But don't slander Ron Burgundy. OK. OK. Thank you. Stay classy. Thank you. But anyways. He went through his whole narrative, how busy he is, how important he is, how, you know, everybody just always needs something. And how would I have time to murder somebody when I'm so busy? And it never really was explained what Danny Singleton had called for that morning because Brooks, like his brother Nick, suffered from short term memory loss. Now, Crystal's father, Tommy Ballard, commented on this arrest, saying, quote, I say if anybody knows something, it would be him, referring to Danny Singleton. He's worked for him for a long time. I feel like that's the only person he would trust. I hope in a couple weeks they can solve this case. I'm hoping Danny will tell them something if he knows something. I just hope it's not another five months, end quote. When asked if he would be in support of Danny Singleton being offered a plea deal in exchange for information that might bring Crystal home, Tommy Ballard said he would be in support of doing whatever it took, stating that Danny had been Brooks's employee, but he'd also been Crystal's friend. Quote, Crystal went and picked him up when Brooks wouldn't go get him after work and took him home and took him places. You'd think he'd have a heart for Crystal. End quote. You'd think, right? Now, according to court paperwork, on or about September 16th, Singleton had made 38 materially false statements while under oath in front of the grand jury. The indictment stated that a woman named Sandra Pointer would testify that Danny had been with her when he claimed to have been in Louisiana at the time of Crystal's disappearance. Also, a man named Michael Price would testify that he'd seen Danny at his house in Bardstown on July 3rd, 2015. So once again, this is a grand jury. What happens in these grand jury um arenas, we don't know unless they get released. We don't know. It's supposed to be secret, which is also going to play a part in in this this case. It's supposed to be a secret. Nobody who's the subject of the grand jury, which in this case would be Brooks Houck, should know what's being said in the grand jury. So we don't know what it is exactly that Danny Singleton lied about. From what I could gather, it seems that he lied about his whereabouts during the time of Crystal's disappearance. It looks, if I had to kind of guess, that he said he was in Louisiana when he, in fact, was not. And but 38, he made 38 materially false statements while under oath in front of the grand jury. So that's a lot, right? Yeah, it's a problem. (laughs) So I'm sure there's a lot more that he lied about that we just don't know about yet that's going to come out during the trial in 2024 um, if it gets there. I mean— I was always I kind of was try, trying to think like if I'm Brooks Houck, I'm probably going to tr- try to see if I can take a plea deal. No, but no. knowing this dude, knowing this dude, because he's he is innocent until proven guilty. And knowing him, he's going to take it all the way because, like you said, he's got money. He thinks he can hire a lawyer who's going to do enough um, antics and make enough appeals and delay enough where it's going to be worth his while to see if he can 
especially without a body, right? Like to see if he can, uh, you know, take his chances with a jury. I just don't think it's going to go well for him considering the case. It, it, it does seem like it's circumstantial, but once again, we don't know what the police have. Yeah, um, it, it seems very circumstantial. I, it I think seems to- that way, but in totality, there's a lot there that yeah. that's connecting dots, and that's only like you just said what's been released so far. But without a doubt, this guy has money, resources, mm-hmm. connections, and he is adamant about the fact that he had nothing to do with this. And this guy will go to his grave saying he had nothing to do with Crystal's disappearance. Yeah, he'll be a Scott Peterson. Th- that yeah. He's never going to yeah. say he did it. Now, there is a world, and I'm saying this because we have to, but also because it could be true you know, to a certain degree. Maybe he didn't have any involvement with it, and that's why he's so uh, he's obviously so adamant about it because this is – a terrible thing to be accused of if you didn't have anything to actually do with it. But yeah, he's got the, he's, you said it last episode. I mean, he's, he has like, I don't know what it was like 90 something properties that you said a 245 acre piece of f- farmland. This guy's a multi-millionaire. Don't let the interview fool yes, you just by a sudden has, twang. Yeah. He is. He's, he's quite wealthy. Yeah. He, they're, they're talking about him being able to put up the money to get out on bail. And it, is, it has 10 a million. $10 million bail. And yeah. he can do it. So if you don't think there's a high powered defense attorney salivating to get access to this case, not only because of the publicity, but also because of the financial gain that could come from this. Yeah. You better bet your ass that someone who knows what they're doing is going to be on this case. And all I could say to Detective Jon Snow and everybody out there doing it, this don't case. Don't say his name like that, man. Put some respect sure, on his name. Make sure you dot your I's and cross your F and T's because this is I don't care what you have. You don't have a body right now. and As they, far as we know, though, Derek. I, I, They don't have a body. We know that for sure. How do we know that for sure? If they had found remains that were a link to her, they would have announced that. Maybe they want to wait till the trial because, like, they mm. took in her car, right? And they did, like, forensics and stuff on it. Have not released what they found in that car or if they found anything in the car. There's another car we're going to talk about, a white Buick. They also took that in, did forensics on it, have not said what's found in that car. So there could be a ton of physical evidence that we just don't know about This yet. is why I'm going to say I don't believe that's the case. And I'm not going to steal your thunder because I'm, from talking to you earlier, I know it's in the episode later tonight. There's yeah. something that they revealed at the bail hearing that I would absolutely consider information they wouldn't release until they were going to make an arrest. But yet at the bail hearing, they said something that they were currently working on that they were one step away from. Doesn't have anything to do with Brooks, though. It has it, to do with his brother. But still, it's something that didn't have to be out there. I am absolutely positive if they had confirmation that they had elements of a, a human remains that belonged f- to familial DNA that matched Crystal, not only for the community, but also for her family, everyone would know that they had that. They wouldn't link it to whoever yet. They would just say, we found the human remains for for Crystal. All right. So here's what I think they have. I think they have physical evidence that they found in one or both of these vehicles. And and keep in mind, they also went through Brooks's vehicle. What do you mean by physical evidence? Like that Um, that proves she was killed? DNA, blood, yeah, something like that. That proves she was in those vehicles at some point. I think they have that. They went through Brooks's house. They went through his brother's house. They went through his mother's house, his grandmother's house. They went through all of their vehicles. They found something somewhere in, in one of these places that, that physically ties Crystal and her murder to these people. I also think, based on the people that they've arrested, they have somebody who said, this is what happened, and this is who was involved, and this is where she is, or where we put her. I could see that being the case. Case Homicide investigations without a body are always difficult because you're, you're, left, you're left with two major, major hurdles to I overcome. Mean, yeah. One, you have to try and prove or at least explain why you think think that the victim is deceased. Yeah. Secondly, you have to prove or at least articulate why you think that she was killed at the hands of another. Mm -hmm. It's not enough just to say she's dead because the argument could be made she died of natural causes. She got lost in the woods. and So you have to prove those two things without a body. It's Mm -hmm. extremely difficult. And it makes it a very, it makes it an easier process for a defense attorney to poke holes in your case. So they got a big battle here. I know on the surface, and like I said, we covered this on Crime Feed. That's how I became aware of it. 
and you know, Nancy Grace, she's big on it. She's like, you know, he did it. She even, she's the one person who actually interviewed Brooks and she has no problem being like, yeah, he's, he's lying through his teeth. And I don't necessarily disagree with her, but I do think that what we believe and what can happen during a trial are two very different things. And that's not my belief. We've seen it. We have seen it happen time and time again. And so I'm a, I, I, this is not a case where I'm going into it thinking, oh my God, this is a slam dunk. This is a slam dunk. We're good to go. There's some, there's some, I, I, I just hope that everybody who's working this case is, is taking it seriously, which it sounds like they are, by the way, I'm not suggesting that they're not. It sounds like they know what they're up against. This is a very influential family and they know that they have money and that 1000% is in the back of the minds of everybody working this case, knowing that when they go to court with this, they're going to have all the cannons directed right at them and they're going to hit them with everything. So they got to they got to treat this case not only as investigators, but also as defense attorneys. So they're prepared for both. Yeah. Considering that this is going on a decade of being unsolved. Yeah. They know less. so much more. So much more than they have released because it's it's actually crazy to see like they'll announce an arrest, but then they won't say anything about it. And you kind of have to like piece things together through different articles and stuff. Whereas you you don't usually see people or law enforcement keeping things that close to the chest. So that's why I think they have a ton and I cannot wait. I cannot wait to the trial. But let's get back to Danny Singleton. Mm -hmm. Okay. Danny Singleton gets arrested. He's charged with 38 material false materially false statements while under oath in front of the grand jury he would be indicted on all 38 charges but he pleaded guilty to 38 lesser charges of false swearing and he was sentenced to 360 days in jail it was another phone call the ballards didn't want to get this time from the nelson county commonwealth's attorney he told me that that's a year in jail so I said, okay, so that's a year. So does that mean he has time served? And he said, pretty much. According to the Commonwealth's attorney, Danny Singleton, the man indicted on 38 counts of perjury in connection to Crystal Rogers' disappearance, pled guilty to 38 lesser charges of false swearing. His sentence, 360 days. Disappointed. <laughs> but you know, we've been disappointed so many times that you get to where you don't know what to think anymore because you just don't know. You don't know who to trust. You don't know what to do. After almost eight months in jail, Singleton will spend the remainder of his sentence on probation. If he gets out, what do we have now? Singleton was indicted in December after police say he lied under oath early on in the investigation into Crystal Rogers' disappearance. He is a longtime friend of Rogers' boyfriend, Brooks Houck, who police named as a suspect but never charged. And Rogers' parents say they've always thought he's known something that could help them find their daughter. I always said if he trusted anybody outside their family, it would be him. So. Even though the Ballards say this is just another setback, they say there is a silver lining. Now they may be able to talk to Singleton themselves. I would like him to look me in my face and tell me he had nothing to do with my daughter. It's still unclear exactly what Singleton lied about under oath, but the Ballards say they hope that now that he has pled guilty, that they'll be able to get those documents and find out for themselves. And real quick, just a reminder, that's from 2015. A lot has happened since that video. Mm -hmm. So we have to remember that that's from 2015. A lot has transpired since then. We're yes. going to continue going with it. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Most of you have probably heard us sing the praises of pros in their truly custom made-to-order hair care. Switching to a custom routine from pros was one of the best things I've done for my hair, and the results that I'm seeing just keep getting better and better. So I really love the fact that using pros gives me a lot of benefits, uh, which we're going to talk about in a second. But basically, my hair used to sort of be unmanageable, or some days it would look great, and some days it would be unmanageable, and I just never knew what 
what day it was going to be. And using pros has given me so much more consistency in my hair, which honestly, it might sound stupid, but it's it released some stress in my life because I wake up knowing that whatever the day brings, my hair will at least be looking decent and and oftentimes amazing. It's shinier, it's smoother, it's softer, it's stronger. And I love the products. I love their unique formula. I love the, the way that they smell. And I love that you can sort of tweak your formula based on changes in your lifestyle. And also you can keep your hair guessing so that it doesn't get too used to a formula and adapt to it and so that the formula stops being as effective. Pros knows that there's more to you than just your hair type. And they've given over 1 million consultations with their in-depth hair quiz. That's exactly how I got started and it's how you'll get started as well. They ask you questions, some you would expect, some you might not. Uh, They ask you, you know, do you dye your hair? What kind of treatments do you do to your hair? But they also ask you things like your zip code, what kind of diet and exercise routine you have, things like that. And by analyzing over 85 personal factors, Pros handpicks clean, sustainably sourced ingredients that get closer to your hair goals with every wash. My favorite feature, like I said, is Pros' review and refine tool. This lets me tweak my formula for any reason in case I change up my address, my hair color, even my diet. Uh, I have used this feature. I use it often. I do like to keep my hair guessing. And depending on what I want to do with my hair, whether I want to wear it curly or whether I want to wear it straight, I'm going to use a different formula. And as a carbon neutral certified B Corp, Pros is an industry leader in clean and responsible beauty. All their ingredients are sustainably sourced, ethically gathered, and cruelty free. They're also the first custom beauty brand to go carbon neutral. And if you're not 100% positive that Pros is the best hair care you've had, they will take the products back, no questions asked. I do want to recommend the Pros hair oil, at least my formula. It's been one of the best hair oils I've ever used. It's not too heavy. It moisturizes without weighing down. There's a very thin line for my hair between being normal and being a complete grease ball. So I love a good oil that does what it's supposed to, moisturizes, make my hair shinier, but doesn't make it look oily. So definitely check that out if you're interested. And Derek's going to tell you how. Custom made to order hair care from Pros has your name all over it. Take your free in-depth hair consultation and get 50% off your first subscription order today, plus 15% off and free shipping every subscription order after that. Just go to pros.com slash crime weekly. That's P-R-O-S-E dot com slash crime weekly for your free in-depth hair consultation and 50% off your first subscription order. Okay, so in January of 2016, Tommy and Sherry Ballard filed a motion to stop Brooks Houck from leaving Kentucky with Eli, who he still had custody of despite being named as a suspect in Eli's mother's disappearance. In the motion, the attorney for the Ballard stated that Brooks being a suspect, his brother being fired from the Bardstown Police Department, and his employee being indicted on perjury charges might have made Brooks want to leave the state. And they found out that Brooks had also been attempting to sell many of his real estate holdings for below market value. So basically, like, he's just trying to take what he can get for these Building things. Building up the cash. And and get some cash and maybe get, get the hell out of Dodge, right? Mm-hmm. That's what they were worried about. Now, at that point, Tommy and Sherry were, you know, did have custody of their four other grandchildren, and they were able to see their grandson, Eli, once a week on Saturdays. But for some reason, Eli's siblings had still been unable to see their brother. And basically, the Ballards were like, we want to have, you know, more time with him and we want his brothers and sisters to be able to see him. And what the hell's going on here? And this has been a constant battle. In fact, custody for Eli is still being dealt with in court between Sherry Ballard and uh, Brooks Houck's mother. And, you know, since Brooke has been arrested, it's just been a mess. I feel so bad for this kid. On June 1st, 2016, 82-year-old Anna Whitesides was subpoenaed to testify in connection with a white Buick that she had owned at the time of Crystal's disappearance. So Anna is Brooke's grandmother. While the police were conducting their investigation, Crystal's father, Tommy, had been doing his own investigation. Crystal's mother, Sherry, said that their family had spent countless hours looking for Crystal. And Sherry said, quote, from the minute that Crystal went missing, my husband was like the investigator. He went around town. We picked up every video. He mapped out every area that he thought our daughter could have been in. If he wasn't physically looking for my daughter, he was on the Internet looking at everything. End quote. It appears that Tommy had also hired a private investigator who 
kind of through asking around, had discovered that a white Buick had been parked at a peculiar location on the Houck family farm the night Crystal had vanished. Apparently, a hunter had seen the Buick there. Now, the Ballards posted about the car on Facebook, and they received a message that basically claimed the Buick they were looking for could be located at the home of 82-year-old Anna Whiteside, who, like I said, was the grandmother of Brooks Houck. Additionally, a witness had come forward and said that he'd seen Crystal's car around 10.30 p.m. on the night she went missing, and it was on that Bluegrass Parkway. And this person had also seen a white car pulled off the road about a mile from Crystal's car, and they described it as being this white Buick. Now, Tommy Ballard gave this information to the police who confirmed that Anna Whiteside had owned a white Buick at the time the Crystal went missing, but it had been sold to a dealer in early 2016. The subpoena claimed that the car might have been used to transport and dispose of Crystal Rogers' body before the car had been cleaned and sold so that the authorities could not retrieve evidence from it. When Anna Whiteside was subpoenaed, she pleaded the fifth and refused to say anything. Her lawyer, Jason Floyd, claimed that Anna had been cooperative with the police. She'd been interviewed twice and she'd willingly led them to the dealer who she'd sold the car to. But even after this, police had subpoenaed her and she had every right to plead the fifth at this point. That's what her lawyer said. The Buick was recovered and searched for forensic evidence before being released. No charges were filed against anyone in the Houck family at that time. And the Ballards were obviously frustrated by this, saying, quote, we want to know who drove the car, and she knows, and that's why she isn't telling, end quote. Although the police have not revealed if they found anything in the Buick, Tommy Ballard did state at the time that he had heard they'd found DNA in the car. And years later, for the Oxygen series, The Disappearance of Crystal Rogers, reporter Stephanie Bauer and retired homicide detective Dwayne Stanton, they were able to track the Buick down and they performed additional forensic testing on it. They met with forensic reconstruction specialist Joe Stidham, who reexamined the car, found some interesting pieces of potential evidence. Under one of the seats, Stidham found a GPS unit. And he said, quote, the GPS is a big find. It looks like an older model. So I don't think it's something the dealership placed in the car. It could potentially tell us where the car was in July of 2015 when Crystal went missing, end quote. Stidham also found fluid stains on the lining of the Buick, which he said he planned to test for human blood. Now, I don't know if they ever did find anything in the car. I don't know if the GPS unit led them to anything. I don't know if they found any DNA. Um... I think it's, I don't know, it's doubtful that the stain did test positive for blood or at least Crystal's blood because police and prosecutors claimed a year later that the show had not turned over any new evidence to them. But they could just be saying that because they don't want people to know that there was evidence found. I don't know. It's it's very, it's hard to sort of pin it down. Well, the whole thing's troubling. Well, on the surface, obviously very does not look good. Yeah. For for the family and for the Hauk family, <laughs> for the Hauk family, obviously the vehicle. It makes a lot of sense that if if Brooks was involved in Crystal's death or disappearance or both, he would have needed another vehicle or someone else to be with him to transport him or to pick up whoever drove Crystal's vehicle to that location. Right. And dumped it there. It would have been a two person job. So it could be a situation where Brooks calls up his grandmother, Anna, and says, hey, Graham, I need the vehicle, your your Buick for a little bit. I'm going to be transporting some stuff. Can I borrow it? And that could be why she's claiming claiming the fifth, because she doesn't want to admit that Brooks had the vehicle that day. Or Mm -hmm. it could be a situation where he said, hey, Graham, I'm stuck on the side of the road. Can you come pick me up? And he might not have told her everything, Mm -hmm. but just said, hey, I'm stuck over here in Crystal's car. Can you come grab me real quick? Yeah, no problem, grandson. I'll come get you. She picks him up and she's not an idiot. So she's realizing this is bad. And I'm just better off not saying anything. Like, I didn't know what happened. I didn't know what he was using it for. I didn't know what he wanted me to pick him up. But if I say that he had me come pick him up from Crystal's car, he's done. So I'm pleading the fifth because I'm not going to go there. Now, that's speculation on my part. I'm not saying I mean, that's what happened. I mean, they could have him and Nick. This is just speculation on my part. Him and Nick could have taken her car. Yeah, grandma. You know, she's like in her 80s. Yeah. She's asleep. They go in her house, grab her keys. They, She's asleep. They don't even tell her. But then yeah. after when they find out Tommy Ballard's on to the white Buick because they see that it's being posted about on Facebook, they have to go to her now and they have to say, yo, listen, Grandma. We got to get rid of this car. So we took the car that night. We didn't do anything with it, but it's going to look bad. It's going to look bad, Grandma. 
And you know we're sweet little innocent choir boys. We would never do that, but it's going to look bad. So mm. it would be best if you just don't say anything at all. Yeah. yeah. And now as far as the car itself, let's let's unpack that real quick, right? So the car itself, obviously you want to have the car that's great, but chain of custody becomes a huge issue with this, right? The car was sold to a dealership. You got tons of people in and out of it. It's been can cleaned. It, yeah. Can it be proven that Crystal had been in that vehicle even one time before her disappearance where she was in that car willingly because it was, again, her grandmother as well, technically. Mm -hmm. Now, well, they weren't married, but they were, they, were they married? Crystal and Brooks? Yeah. No. They weren't married. They, they just had one together, son together, though. Eli. Yeah. So they weren't, te they weren't technically married, but they were living together. So now Graham, Anna's part of her family as well. Maybe Crystal had been in that vehicle before. So that could explain some of the DNA. As far as the oxygen series with them doing the testing and the GPS unit after the fact, Let's just say for the sake of this conversation, it's all legit. Mm -hmm. The problem again becomes, and I've dealt with this as a detective on TV, right? The chain of custody is not the same. The question well, you think becomes, that, that would matter with the GPS unit, though, because we can't really you, meddle with that. If I was a that. defense attorney, if I was a defense attorney, I would say, how do I know you didn't take a GPS unit off another vehicle that that was, you know, and reprogrammed it and stuck it on that car before you started mm. filming? Now, I don't think that happened. I know some of the guys you're talking about from the Oxygen series. Yeah. I know they didn't do that, mm -hmm. but that's not what's important. Yo, what if there was something on the GPS unit and it led them to where Crystal's body was, but because it's like fruit of the poisonous, the, what, fruit of the poisonous tree or something? Well, right? it would have to be, no, that wouldn't, but if that were the case, it wouldn't fall into that because let's say they got it from a TV show that did a search of the vehicle, yeah. they turn it over because yeah. everything would have to be turned over to law enforcement, right? Yeah. If it's lawfully obtained where they didn't steal that car out of a, 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 a junkyard, mm -hmm. they, they got the car, they did a search on it. These are trained investigators. They say, hey, can we get an investigator over here? We just found something. Comes over here, the detective takes possession of that GPS unit, runs it. That's not fruit of a poisonous tree. That's honestly legally lawfully obtained. But you said it was like... Well, what I'm a saying chain is of questioning. Custody issue. What I'm saying is the chain of custody issue and the integrity of the evidence itself, right? So if I'm the defense attorney, and there's this raw footage of these investigators on TV, which they are actually investigators, by the way. Yeah. But they're on TV saying, "Oh, look what I found—a GPS unit that apparently everyone else missed." Right? <laughs> yeah. I would, as a defense attorney, say, "How do we know that?" Because you said that that car was already searched. Uh, yeah. So how do we know? that you didn't take that GPS unit off another vehicle, program some hack into it where you can change the coordinates, stick it under the fender, turn the cameras on, and pretend like you found this massive smoking sure. gun. And that's what I'm saying. If that GPS unit led to Crystal's body, the defense could argue to have the GPS unit thrown out. Therefore, whatever they found because of that GPS unit could not be introduced into court as evidence. I'm not a lawyer. I love where you, I love where your head's at. I'm not a lawyer, so I, I I but I wouldn't say that would happen because here's what would here's what I think what would happen, happen, right? Fruit of a poisonous tree is if they go into someone's house, they illegally, unlawfully take the evidence, and it leads to something positive, right? But if that evidence that could be in question, like is it actual, really evidence, or was it just something for TV? What are the chances if it's fake that the GPS coordinates on the G unit are going to actually lead to the victim's body? Well, they could say. Oh, they found her body already. They knew where it was. And now they're framing him by putting it in the GPS, well, putting yeah, those I mean, coordinates in the GPS that was in his grandmother's car. So now they're framing him. And they and could the, even go, they could go further and say that the investigators on the show were involved in this and actually acting as agents of the state. And therefore, even though they weren't employed by the, the law enforcement agency, they're acting as agents of the state. And therefore, the, the procedure in which they can obtain that vehicle is different because now they're being recognized as officers. Yeah, there's problems with it. Um, and there could be something connected to it. I would hope that oxygen turned everything over, especially yes. if it's all on the up and up and police officers got involved like Jon Snow and said, hey, don't do anything else. We missed it. Thank you. We need that. Don't touch it. Don't do anything else with it. We're we're effectively taking that from you with or without your consent. Mm -hmm. We're 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 we're, we're going to issue a search warrant for it. We need that. So, yeah, that could yeah, have happened. Absolutely. Crazy. 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 Let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. 
not indulging this time of the year is honestly a crime. And you know me, I'm not one to pass up something delicious, especially during this colder season when we get to wear sweaters and baggier clothes. And I'm not always thinking about everything I put in my mouth, you know, all those Christmas cookies. But then there are those nights after all that holiday fun that I really just need a nourishing dinner made with real ingredients. My body's craving it. And thankfully, with Daily Harvest, I'm getting the best of both worlds, something nourishing, something healthy, and something delicious. Daily Harvest helps keep my stomach and my freezer full by delivering my favorite fruit and veggie-packed meals right to my door. You have got to try Daily Harvest's new addition for dinner, pasta. Think pesto, bolognese, primavera, but with a lot more veggies and a lot less work. And Daily Harvest has gluten-free, dairy-free, and ready in under 10 minutes pasta, which, I mean, it's perfect when it's getting dark at like 3 o'clock and you really don't feel like making dinner. These are the perfect solution for you. And with little time on the calendar between the holiday feasts and parties, I get easy to prep options for other times of day too. They have smoothies, which are my favorite. Daily Harvest smoothies are my favorite. They have harvest bowls and soups, and I never have to think about what to cook so I can skip the shopping, chopping, and post-cooking cleanup. So like I said, the smoothies are my favorite. I love them. I have at least one every single day and have for over a year, but I will also see say that their pasta options have been amazing and I love the bolognese. Bolognese is one of my favorite pastas. They have a great pesto too. It tastes so fresh. It's literally like you're in the middle of spring when it's dark and cold outside and it's just delicious. And by using recyclable or compostable packaging when possible, Daily Harvest is doing their part to take care of our earth and this helps me limit my waste and feel better. So we love Daily Harvest. We think you will too. Derek's going to tell you how you can check them out for yourself. Get the best of both worlds with Daily Harvest. Just go to dailyharvest.com slash crimeweekly to get up to $65 off your first box. That's dailyharvest.com slash crimeweekly for up to $65 off your first box. One more time, dailyharvest.com slash crimeweekly. So the year 2016 also brought many law enforcement searches of the Hauk family farm, which was owned by Rosemary Hauk, who's the mother of Brooks and Nick. Now, this property had already been searched within days of Crystal's disappearance because law enforcement had claimed that police dogs had picked up no scent of Crystal in her abandoned car, but the dogs had attracted her scent to the Hauk family farm. Once again, where did they pick up the scent, if not in her car? I don't know. I, I don't know. They, they didn't reveal that. But allegedly, they really focused on the Hauk family farm and, and came out publicly and said many times, Detective Jon Snow said to the media, they believed that something had happened to Crystal on that farm. So obviously, they're searching it within a couple of days. And police spent about four hours on the farm the day of the first search. But if they found anything, it was never revealed. After this search, Tommy Ballard had asked the Hauk family if he could search the farm with cadaver dogs, but he was told no. In August of 2016, law enforcement returned to the property with a search warrant, 18 cadaver dogs, more than two dozen investigators, and a dive team. This search lasted two days, and afterwards, police revealed that they had found items of interest that were taken to the state crime lab to be analyzed, with Detective John Snow saying, quote, We were hopeful that we might find more, but you find what you find, and the evidence takes you where it takes you. I don't anticipate coming back to the farm, end quote. All right, so here's what I think about this statement. I think they found plenty. Oh, and my they God. Went back, Here you go. Listen, again. and they went, You're, dude, he, I think he's What are you going to do when you find out that everything we know is what they found? Yo, I know that's not the case, No, but it's Jesus. not the case. He's, Detective John Snowman, I hate cool that you keep as calling a cucumber. By his full name. Like, he's like Dick Tracy. Cool as a cucumber. Winter is coming, man. What do you man? know when you find out that John Snow has like this horrible jacket where he's like it's a not, terrible it's not, cop? It's not, it's not, it's not the case. Cool as a cucumber. I think he's playing this like down. I don't anticipate coming back to this farm. Yo, they were back at that farm five, six times. The FBI went back to the farm. They were back to the farm a million times after he said this, right? I so wish you talked about me... me like you talk about Detective Jon Snow. <laughs> Jesus. I do, just not to your face. <laughs> yeah, clearly not, because nobody ever says this. <laughs> he's really downplaying this to the media because he doesn't want Brooks or Nick 
or Rosemary or Anna or any of these freaking hawks to get spooked and take off running, right? He doesn't want them to start hiding evidence. So he's like, oh, we're not going to be back to the farm. I wish we'd found more. I think they found plenty. And we know for a fact that they went back to that farm several times for more searches and continued collecting evidence from the farm. And we'll find that a huge piece of evidence would be found at the Hauk family farm when later on. Yeah, and well, let's add one more layer to it. Yes, layer it up. He's going after one of his own. This is a chess match against another police officer. Yes, yeah, somebody who smeared his name and reputation. This is another police. There's another police officer involved in this equation who has friends and acquaintances that are probably friends of his. This is a close knit community. They 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 they're neighboring departments. He's probably known of of Nick prior to this incident. He's got to be careful of what's being disseminated in his own police department because he doesn't know Mm -hmm. what friends Nick has on that PD. True that. So this is a really difficult situation. To So to your point, he could be keeping a lot close to the vest because he's not only protecting it from the media, but but he's also protecting it from his own people. Yeah. That could be a mole. This could be a movie down the road. He's navigating this with grace, I would say. (laughs) (laughs) You better hope for your sake this guy is half of what you're portraying him to be. Listen, my gut you instinct hope. my gut instinct about people is never wrong. Your I sometimes cart is hitched it. to this horse. Dude, I want I sometimes, you to know that. I, I, like I'll tell you, my gut instinct about people has never been wrong. Sometimes I ignore the red flag. Sometimes I ignore my instinct, but it has never been wrong. I'm not going to say nothing. There's, I know. <laughs> I said sometimes I ignore it. Okay. 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 To be fair, so <laughs> okay. this search, <laughs> this search. Apparently, we don't really know exactly what items of interest were collected, but the Ballards claim that at least one piece of farm equipment was seized. And remember, Detective John Snow was asking Brooks about that backhoe. He was asking him about it. He was real interested in it. The backhoe that Brooks went back to the farm on July 4th, hanging out at the family farm on July 4th when his wife, well, his girlfriend's gone. He don't know where she is. And he's messing around with the backhoe. Okay. So, two days after the search, divers went into Melody Lake. So, Melody Lake is near the Hauk Farm. And this lake has been, once again, the focus of multiple searches. Reportedly, cadaver dogs continue to indicate to a small portion of this lake multiple times. They sent divers in, but allegedly the divers did not look at this small portion of the lake. Although, that doesn't make sense. So, that could just be false reporting. Because why would you not look at the place that the cadaver dogs continued indicating? The Ballards have tried to get the lake drained multiple times. They aren't able to do that. It's a pretty big lake. So divers have gone in multiple times. They haven't found anything. But that doesn't mean that there's nothing to be found in the lake. It just means they haven't found it, if there is. That's fair. Now, by the fall of 2016, Crystal's father, Tommy Ballard, was telling people he knew that he was onto something that might finally lead to the truth about what had happened to his daughter. Tommy's search for the truth had become his entire life, and he'd meticulously documented everything in a box, including photos, videos, timelines, searches. And in Tommy's box, Stephanie Bauer and Dwayne Stanton found multiple surveillance videos that he'd collected from around town. And that white Buick, the one that was owned by Anna Whiteside, that was seen in many of them, which meant that even before law enforcement had started questioning her and had, you know, put her in front of a jury and tried to get some answers, Tommy Ballard was putting two and two together. He was already hot on the trail. He was. And he was telling people close to him. Nothing like motivation, like a father's love for his daughter. Right? For you real. can't top that. And at the beginning of November of 2016, Sherry Ballard told a local radio station that she believed and Tommy believed that he was being followed by someone. And then two weeks later, on November 19th, 2016, Tommy Ballard, Crystal Rogers' father, was shot dead during a hunting trip. And this hunting was no trip. Uh, can this we, was can no we air hunting accident. For people on video? No, he was on a hunting trip, but it was no hunting accident as law mm. enforcement initially rolled it. We, they you and I went back and accident. forth on this. I I, rem- I saw reports from Sherry that said they hadn't gone hunting yet. You you don't agree with that? I mean, there's interviews with Sherry and her son Casey who was there. I think from what Sherry was saying is they were going on a hunting trip, but they weren't actively out hunting yet. Why they were they were, on like, the land where they were hunting then? Yeah, it's a big plot of land, but they hadn't they weren't like actually hunting at that point yet. They were getting ready to go. Regardless, they went out with the intention to hunt. 
That that is correct, and that's okay. what Sherry said. But everyone's like, "Oh, they were out in the woods, and they were already actively hunting, and he was killed." No, that's not what happened. That's it, what it looks like. It, so it looks like they were not in the woods. They yeah. were in an open sort of area. But here's the thing. Okay, so let me let me break it down. That morning, Tommy, his son Casey, who's Crystal's brother, Casey's son Brendan, and Crystal's twelve year old son Trip, they left to go hunting early in the morning when it was still dark. They were planning to hunt on the Ballard family land, which is actually adjacent to the Bluegrass Parkway where Crystal's car was found. The four had split up. Casey and his son Brendan went off together, and then Tommy took Crystal's son Trip out. Later, Trip would report that they were, you know, in this kind of like open area. There's like woods on the outskirts, and then there's this open area. There, He and his grandfather are there, and he heard a loud gunshot just before 8 a.m., and then his grandfather fell to the ground. The bullet had entered Tommy Ballard's chest and exited through his back. One bullet. One bullet. This is somebody. Somebody shot him who knows how to shoot, shoot a gun. somebody. Yeah. Right. And by the way, open field. So you have accidents sometimes where hunters are on the same land. But this is, again, this was private land, I believe. This was the Ballard land. It was this private was land. land. So nobody mm-hmm. else should have been out there. But you do have situations sometimes where I actually had this happen to one of my best friends growing up. Him and his father went out hunting. His father actually shot him. He mistaken him for a deer. They got Dude, separated. Dude, my father got shot in the knee by his cousin when they were out hunting. Okay, he was like 19. <laughs> so it does it does happen. But like you All said, Tommy was out in an open field. You would definitely be able to identify your target if you're making a shot that yeah. can sight that that accurately. So whoever shot him knew what they were shooting at. 100. percent And there's there's evidence of this. So oh, yeah, Tommy Ballard at the age of 54 was pronounced dead at the scene just a year and four months after his daughter had vanished. A year and four months where he made himself a nuisance to the Hawk family, where he told anyone and everyone that it was his mission to his dying breath that he would find out what happened to his daughter. And he was on the path to doing that. From the moment that they found out Tommy was dead, his family was not buying the story that it had been a hunting accident. Tommy's son, Casey, said that everyone knew he and Tommy would take the first week of rifle season off of work to hunt, and everyone knew where they hunted because it was their land. It was their land, yeah. Yeah. The police would later claim that the shot had come from an opening in the wood line. So the wood line is like you've got a, a forest, and that's and then, then kind of like an open area, and so the, the forest would be the wood line. Yep. And Casey said um this opening in the wood line it had not been there in the 14 years that they'd owned the property and police would locate branches of trees that had been freshly sawed off and you can tell when branches have been sawed off or broken off you can tell when they're fresh because they're still going to be green on the inside they haven't been exposed to the air long enough to harden up and darken up still going to be green you're still going to be able to see the sap and everything And whoever did this had sawed off enough branches to leave an opening where they could get a clear shot at Tommy. And just this year, new information has been revealed by prosecutors suggesting a very possible connection between Tommy Ballard's death slash murder and Brooke Houck's brother, Nick, former police officer uh, who suffers from short term memory loss. They're waiting on tests to come back on the firearm they believe was used to murder Tommy Ballard in 2016. And he revealed the gun came from Brooks Houck's brother. A firearm that we purchased from Nicholas Houck, who was using a fake name when he sold the rifle. We know it's the same caliber. There's five criteria that the they're looking at, and so far it's matched four of the five criteria. At this time, no members of the Houck family have been charged in connection with Tommy Ballard's death. So this is what we were alluding to earlier, right? There's there's a lot here. They're already starting to put some of this stuff out there. They're talking about the different criteria. You're going to be looking at the type of weapon, the caliber of weapon, the firing pin indentations on the rifle casings themselves as they're being fired. And also, we've talked about this before, the striations uh, as the rounds, the the shell casings are being extracted from the rifle. So they'll get this rifle. They purchased it from Nick. We, You and I had talked off camera about this. We can get into it here. But it does sound like what you're saying, like maybe there was an undercover operation or something where they purchased a gun directly from Nick, knowing it was Nick, but, but he was giving a fake name. Yes. So then they take this rifle. They're going to go to a, a, a crime lab. 
They're going to fire that rifle multiple times inside mm-hmm. of a controlled environment. They're then going to take the shell casings that they find there. If they have shell casings at the crime scene, they would compare them. I don't know if they do or not. Along that wood line, I don't know if they were able to find the shell casings. I'm assuming that the person would have taken those shell casings, especially. Believe me, it was one bullet, right? One single bullet. So, yes, I'm sure he did. It would have taken it, so you probably wouldn't have that, but there would be other characteristics that they could look at and, and see if there's a match. And man, not good, right? That the, the brother of the person who's alleged to have killed this woman and who this brother may have been involved in some way just so happens that a gun kills the, the victim's father and it happens to belong to the brother of the suspect. Mm-hmm. Yikes. And, Yikes. And, and why did they release that? They released that before... Before charging Nick, which to me I found surprising, honestly, I found well, that surprising. Well, they have to. They like you said. They they want to get that fifth, that fifth what characteristic. Is yep. Fifth characteristic. But I wonder what it is that they're waiting on. But there's obviously something that's taking a little time. I mean, the casings why did he, and all that. Why I don't did know. He sell it, dude. Why? There's more to this got to be. I don't know. I don't know how this all came to be, but he was probably trying to dump that gun. I don't know why he wouldn't just wouldn't have just destroyed it. Just and threw it in dumped the lake. it. Yeah. But, yeah. So and and because he's not smart. OK, like, I'm sorry, Nick. Okay, I know you're probably listening, but you're not smart. I know you think you are because you were a cop, but you weren't a good cop. You're not smart because you said a bunch of stupid things during your interview with the Kentucky State Police. You lost your cool um, at that very calm condescending polygraph examiner you're not smart and you thought i'm gonna use a fake name they'll never figure it out you're not smart because the atf was involved right uh the atf has said it's been assisting with the case since crystal went missing in 2015 and it was using special agents and technical assistance from its atf national lab along the crime gun intelligence center in louisville so listen they are on this I think they probably already know. I wouldn't be surprised if we see that Nick Houck is arrested and charged very soon, honestly. No doubt. Yeah. Yeah. Unless there's something dramatic that happens. I I agree with you. And they said that um, they purchased it from him, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you were like, oh, is that what happened? And I, I thought it was a pawn shop or something. No, it looks like Nick thought. He's going to use an alias and sell it, but he didn't know that he was selling it to a member of law enforcement, which, yeah. once again, they, are, they have so much more going could have been an undercover thing. On. It could have been a confidential informant thing as well. It might yeah, not have been direct. They have, have so been much going that went, on that we don't yeah. know about. It could have been I mean? someone who came to him and said, listen, Nick's trying to sell me a gun. You know, and they could have gotten involved in, and they what we would do is provide the money for that purchase or whatever. So we're technically buying it, even though this confidential witness isn't an actual law enforcement agent. No, it's uh, it's it's crazy. This case, we said it from the start when I started telling you about it. This case is actually going to end up being a movie one day. I really do think so. It's that it, so many layers to it, and there's still more to go. You know, Nick. <laughs> is shaking right now man oh uh, yeah <laughs> like uh, yeah. he i'm sorry i don't mean to laugh but it gives me so much pleasure to know that because i truly believe and this is just my opinion huh? how would i know i truly believe that brooks hauk and nick and others were involved with crystal's murder and or disposal of her body i believe when nick hauk sat down in front of those law enforcement agents he knew exactly what happened to crystal who has five kids who no longer have a mother and that dick sat there and acted like a smug piece of shit like he had it all under control and he knew exactly what he was doing you're stupid you're stupid Mm. you sold law enforcement the gun that you used to kill her father with you dumbass shaking i hope you're shaking i hope you're having ulcers and you're like so stressed out that your doctor keeps giving you xanax but it's not enough it's not enough all right now we can go to our last break all right well let's try that again let's go to our last break and we're going to wrap this episode up all right we'll be right back There's never a wrong time to protect your home, but this fall happens to be an especially good time because you can get up to 50% off a brand new Simply Safe home security system. And the Simply Safe home security system was named the best home security of 2023 by U.S. News and World Report. And here at Crime Weekly, 
We definitely agree. We think that it's very important to have some sort of security system in your home. Just putting the sign out there is not going to be enough of a deterrent these days. And it's just good to know what's going around outside of your home. Having a camera, having something there that lets, you know, the nefarious people out there know that they should probably move on to the next house. Simply Safe is comprehensive protection for the whole home. They have advanced sensors that detect break ins, fires, floods, and more, plus HD cameras for both inside and out. And Simply Safe is powered by 24 7 professional monitoring for less than a dollar a day, which is half the cost of traditional home security systems. And with new 24 7 live guard protection and the smart alarm wireless indoor camera, monitoring agents can see and speak to intruders, helping stop crime in real time. This is a powerful technology exclusively from Simply Safe. Satisfaction is backed by Simply Safe's money back guarantee, so you can try Simply Safe for 60 days risk free. If you don't love it, you can return your system for a full refund. So we definitely suggest getting a security system and we definitely recommend Simply Safe. Derek's going to tell you how you can check it out for yourself. Yeah, 100%, especially where we are right now. We're in November. The holidays are here. A lot of us are having packages delivered to our house for not only ourselves, but also our loved ones. You definitely want a proven system like Simply Safe so that not only, you, like Stephanie was saying, it can serve as a deterrent, but if you're one of those people who are in an unfortunate situation where you have something taken, you'll have you'll have the proof to document it and get it to law enforcement. So for a limited time, listeners can get a special 50% off any Simply Safe system with a fast protect plan. Visit simplysafe.com slash crime weekly. That's simplysafe.com slash crime weekly. There's no safe like Simply Safe. I remember that I got into debt very young in life because I was on my own from the time I was 15 and nobody ever taught me how to be careful about predatory credit cards or even how a credit card worked, honestly. So I got myself into trouble uh, pretty early and it was really easy to get into debt, but it was really hard to get out of debt. But there is an option for you if you're in that same position because PDS Debt has customized options for anyone struggling with credit cards, personal loans, collections, or medical bills. And if you're making payments every month on your debt and your balances just aren't going down, this program is for you. PDS Debt rolls all of your payments into one low monthly payment. And everyone with $10,000 or more in eligible debt qualifies. And there's no minimum credit score required. Both bad and fair credit are accepted. You can save thousands in interest and fees and pay off your debt in a fraction of the time with PDS Debt. We definitely feel like PDS Debt is the best solution for everyone who's in a situation where they're facing debt. It's stressful, especially around this time, the holidays. You don't need one more thing stressing you out. And just taking the action of starting a plan that is taking your debt down every month is really a step to just start reducing your debt and your stress. So we think PDS debt is great, and Derek's going to tell you how you can check it out for yourself. Yeah, and we have the best deal possible for you right now because PDS debt is offering a free, that's free, debt analysis. Zero dollars, free. It only takes about 30 seconds, so head on over to pdsdebt.com slash crime to get your free debt assessment today. That's pdsdebt.com slash crime for your free assessment. One more time, that's pdsdebt.com slash crime. All right, so in July of 2017, Kentucky State Police were seen at 730 Pulliam Ave in Bardstown. This is the residence of Anna Whiteside. If you remember, Anna Whiteside. Grandma. Is grandma. Yeah, she's grandma. 80-something-year-old grandma wrapped up in this. Anna's attorney later said that he had not gotten a call about the presence of police at his client's home and he didn't know what they were looking for. But the information he did have about the search was pretty vague. And all he knew was that they were there for bullets and reloading equipment. And he believed the search was in connection to the death of Tommy Ballard. He says this in 2017. Detectives were seen leaving the home around noon with a long object wrapped in paper. Also in July, a woman named Crystal Maupin was arrested after surveillance footage showed her getting out of her car and taking signs that were placed there by Crystal Rogers' family to raise awareness about her disappearance. And then this Crystal Maupin girl was like ripping them up and throwing them out and getting rid of them. Now, who's Crystal Maupin? Well, she happens to be the current girlfriend of Brooks Houck. <laughs> Which is funny because you dated another girl named Crystal. 
And this crystal girl was like, yeah, this is safe for me. (laughs) Some women. Not long after she does this, though, more signs began to appear around Bardstown. Signs like this are popping up all over Bardstown, pointing fingers directly at the Hauk brothers. They grab your attention, and that's the point. I saw the signs. They are very blunt. Sherry Ballard is making it through another 4th of July without her daughter, Crystal Rogers. She disappeared four years ago. Sorry, it's just been a rough week. No one has ever been charged. Without any clear answers, Ballard vows to never let anyone forget Crystal. And when these signs popped up overnight, she says it's comforting. Brooks Houck was named the number one suspect in my daughter's disappearance. And it makes me feel good to think that people out there believe the same thing that I do. We don't want it to die down. We don't want her to be forgotten. This person wants to remain anonymous, but admits to being one of several people planting these signs in the early morning hours of July 4th. They put out 75 signs with specific phrases. We chose uh, Nick Fell the polygraph because Nick did fail the polygraph. Another sign, Brooks Houck is the only suspect in the disappearance of Crystal Rogers. You know, you're still the only suspect, and um, we want to keep that out there. And this one, ride the wave, it's worked out this far. It refers to a statement Brooks Houck made to WDRB. I have been advised, you know, to ride the wave and keep on keeping on, and that's what I've done, and it's worked out great this far. We still think that he's very cold and disrespectful to the family, uncaring. Um, He never really seemed to be... um, at all bothered by her missing, you know, and that's the mother of his son. At the bottom of the sign, we're praying for sharks, another clear, pointed message. The overall goal is we still don't have answers, we still don't have justice, um, and we need to keep them in the public eye until we do. They know in their heart what happened. Reporting in Bardstown, Katrina Helmer, WDRB News. Ride the wave, we're praying for sharks. <laughs> yeah, he was. he's not media trained, that's for sure. Oh, my God. I don't know. I've been told to just ride the wave. It's worked out he, great so far. It's worked out great so far. <laughs> <laughs> Buddy, what you do know you're on here because the mother of your child's missing, right? Uh, worked out great for so sharks. far. We're praying for sharks. By 2018, Sherry Ballard had successfully gained grandparents' rights, so she was able to see her grandson, Eli, every other weekend. But in November, the court ruled that Eli's relationship with his father was more important than his relationship with his grandmother because Brooks had testified that after Eli's visits with Sherry, a now six-year-old Eli would return home sullen and uncooperative. And the Kentucky Court of Appeals ruled that Sherry could no longer see Eli since it was clear that there was significant hostility existing between the Hawks and the Ballards, and this could pose a risk of emotional harm to Eli. I, like, see where they're coming from on this. Yeah. However. To, yeah, I get it. Like, get of it. course there's hostility, right? Yeah. Yep. Of course. Yeah. It's justified, but I can see how that could be difficult for the kid in this situation. Of I have course. To experience I mean, that. the whole situation yep. is difficult for He's poor six years Eli. old. In 2020, the FBI took over as the lead agency investigating Crystal's case, and in August, they released new information about an area of interest in her disappearance. People who lived in the area of Poplar Flat Road and Farm Away Drive in Nelson County were asked to come forward if they'd seen or heard anything unusual in the early morning hours of July 4th, 2015. There was a special interest in surveillance footage that anybody might have, and after this request went out... Obviously, people sent in their surveillance footage and the FBI released photos of two vehicles that they said were related to the investigation. One was a white SUV and a red SUV driving near the My Old Kentucky Home campground. A second photo, which had been taken at 3.45 a.m. on July 4th, showed an unidentified vehicle on Balltown Road, which is close to the intersection of Pascal Ballard Road, which, if you remember, that's where the Hauk family farm is located. It was also revealed that the FBI had conducted more searches on multiple properties, including homes belonging to Brooks and Nick Houck. Of course, the Houck family farm. They went back to um, Anna Whiteside's house. You know, they they were really up the Houck's asses, basically. <laughs> on the morning of August 7th, more than 150 state and federal law enforcement officers began executing nine federal search warrants and announcing that they would be conducting over 50 interviews. These homes and properties have been searched numerous times, but what do you think makes today and the massive searches different? 
Well, today, as we have been hearing from our reporters in the field, the FBI is now the lead investigator in this case. 150 state and federal law enforcement officials are now on scene investigating this. 50 interviews today, that's a lot of questioning of people in Bardstown surrounding this case and nine federal search warrants. We have seen these properties searched in the past, but this is the most extensive we have seen. Now, in 2016, in August of 2016, about a year after Crystal disappeared, we did see another extensive search. This was also on the Hauk family farm. That's about 200, 300 acres. That's a lot of property. They were there for about two days and we saw a lot of evidence being collected. And this search today is very reminiscent of the search uh, a few years ago, but we never heard anything from that search. So we're wondering when are we going to get information from this search as well today? So any thoughts on what might have prompted the FBI to take over this case and these massive searches today, five years after Crystal Rogers disappearance? Well, my understanding uh, from talking to the lead detective at the time from Nelson County, he was saying that they had executed over 70 search warrants over the past few years. And I'm wondering if all of these searches are now puzzle pieces coming together and maybe the FBI has a lot more resources than the Nelson County Sheriff's Office. The Nelson County Sheriff's Office also posting on Facebook this afternoon saying the FBI has much more uh, resources than they do, so they are happy. They are willing to release everything over to the FBI and they are very proud of the work they say that they've done so far that can help move this forward now that the FBI has taken over as the lead investigating agency. In August of 2021, federal agents were seen in the Woodlawn Springs subdivision, where Brooks Houck owned several properties. Actually, this was where he was building three houses at the time of Crystal's disappearance in 2015. Google Earth images from 2014 show the homes under construction, but the home, the driveway of one or two of these homes were not yet finished. Now, these houses were owned by Hauk Rentals LLC, which is owned by Brooks Hauks, who lived just two miles away from that subdivision. Officers used drone cameras, ground scanners, and cadaver dogs on these three properties. And on the third day, they began digging up the driveway of one of these homes. These are some of the concrete slabs hauled away from the home, dug up from the driveway, which appears to be a central focus of the FBI's dig. FBI agents were back for day three of their investigation outside of a home in the Woodlawn Springs subdivision. Large construction equipment was still in the front yard of the home with most of the driveway dug up. Pieces of the driveway along with large piles of dirt were hauled away from the scene. We don't know exactly what led the FBI to this neighborhood or this house, but we do know that suspect Brooks House Construction Company built houses here back in 2015, the year that Crystal Rogers disappeared. The FBI says it's focusing on finding any evidence that could shed light on what happened to Crystal. We talked to a former Church FBI Street, agent of 22 uh, years. He served on the evidence response team like and gives us an idea of what the FBI could be looking for. We're all assuming they're looking for a body and, um, you know, it's probably a, a good assumption, but they could also be looking for uh, murder weapons, um, cell phones, any kind of evidence related to the underlying crime. The former agent tells us the agency must have received a pretty substantial tip or piece of information in order to be digging up people's yards like this. The FBI says it does not have a timeline on when this search could wrap up, but it will continue for as long as it takes. FBI agents are guarding the scene overnight and neighbors expect them to be back for the rest of the week. In Bardstown, Sarah Sidery, WDRB News. In a statement, the FBI said the search came as a result of information gathered by the federal investigation from the past year. And Sherry Ballard said that volunteers with Team Crystal, which is basically the, the community members who came together to keep searching for Crystal, uh, they'd previously searched that same area and a cadaver dog had hit on a dirt mound. But in the end, they hadn't found anything. But she was also saying, and you heard in that clip, they wouldn't be digging up somebody's driveway for no reason. Nope. You know, they, they have to have a good reason to start digging because somebody lives there. You know? Yeah, there's a reason. They have to have a good reason to dig up the driveway. And it, and it may not be, as the uh, former FBI agent said in that video, it may not be that they that they thought a body was there, but there could be something because they were towing away, you know, 
pieces of asphalt, something in there that they were testing for, that they were looking for specifically. In 2023, this year, developments in the case began happening rapidly. On September 7th, 32-year-old Joseph Lawson was arrested in connection to the Crystal Rogers case. Now, at this time, as far as we know, Lawson has no direct ties to Crystal Rogers or Brooks Houck, at least as far as we know. But his father, Steve Lawson, we, we, we would recognize that name because he was mentioned in 2015 during Brooks's police interview with Detective John Snow. During that interview, Brooks called Steve Lawson and Lawson told Brooks, quote, I just want to tell you I'm sorry about everything that's going on in your life, brother. I got you in my prayers, end quote. Brooks responded back, quote, I appreciate you saying that, but I need your help while I got you on the phone. Do you remember the night you called me really, really late? I forgot what you asked me. Can you remember what you asked me or what you were after? I can't remember, end quote. Now, Lawson responded, of course he remembered. He said, oh, I asked you about some numbers for, for houses. And Brooks was like, oh, yeah, the rental properties. And Steve Lawson's like, yeah. But then Lawson also said, you know, you told me to Brooks. He says to Brooks, you told me to call Crystal about something work-related. And so Detective John Snow's like, wait, this was when you were driving home from the family farm with Crystal and Eli in the car, because you were there with them that night. Why would Steve Lawson have t- said that you told him to call Crystal about something work-related when she was sitting right next to you in the truck? And of course, Brooks is like, uh, 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 I mean, like, it's it was late, and like, Crystal doesn't deal with like work stuff when it's late, so that's probably why, but like, he clearly didn't have an answer, and he came up with that and pulled it out of his ass. I would have said she was sleeping. Honestly, if you want to ask me, I'd say she passed out. She was sleeping in the car on the way home, so I didn't want to wake her. But well, that he would came have contradicted with... that she always stayed up late too. So he was like, he was fighting right? multiple battles here. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, she was mul- sleeping in the car. But you said earlier she always stays up late. Yeah, but she al- also always falls asleep when we're in the car. But she is a nar- <laughs> she also has narcolepsy. Yes. <laughs> so, um, yeah. At that time, Brooks told Detective Snow, listen, Steve Lawson is someone who works for me sometimes. He does work for me sometimes. And, you know, he was the one who called him late that night that Crystal had disappeared. Now, at the time of his arrest, Joseph Lawson, who is Steve Lawson's son, he's in a wheelchair and he's paralyzed from the waist down, apparently from a 2021 motorcycle accident. However, this man has a very checkered past. WDRB Investigates has gone through more than a dozen court files to learn more about the Nelson County 32-year-old. We found several women accused him of domestic violence between 2009 and 2021. In this case, in May 2015, just before Rogers disappeared, a woman said Lawson chased me through town, telling me he was going to kill me and everybody I loved. In November 2020 in Marion County, he was found guilty of strangulation and unlawful imprisonment. Court documents show the woman's bruises and marks. The woman says Lawson threatened to kill her. Another court document from October 2020 shows a woman told the Marion County Court she didn't want her fiancé Lawson to be prosecuted, adding, I do not know if I'm allowed to say the details, but Joseph is also assisting in a federal investigation. Just what that federal investigation is, is not known. Lawson himself claims to be a domestic violence victim. Officers responded to the Super and Motel on a report of a woman beating on Lawson in hospice care. Court documents say his father saw the woman hitting Lawson and he was able to hold her down until she was arrested. His records show Lawson's highest education level is a GED and he is self-employed in construction. This sheriff's office report says his full name is listed as Joseph Joey Stephen Lee Allen Lawson and records show he's moved around a lot. There's definitely a period where he was homeless. Wearing orange, Lawson had a court hearing in Washington County, Kentucky via Zoom last week from a hospital bed. He is wheelchair bound. See, obviously, we all know Mr. Lawson's got circumstances uh, in Nelson County. While his criminal mischief charge in Washington County has nothing to do with the Crystal Rogers case, his Nelson County charge was brought up too. I'm just curious as to when he got picked up on the, on the charge out of Nelson County, because obviously whenever he was around, I need to know. I've got actually kind of a limited amount of information that's being uh, given to me by Grayson County Jail, so I don't really have a time frame for which I think he may be um, free of those medical uh, concerns, but I, all that being said, it's preventing me from actually visiting him. Lawson was in a motorcycle crash years ago, and it's believed his injuries are related to that. 
What are some of your frustrations with the case and how it's going? Um, it's still early to say that I'm frustrated. There has been, uh, you know, some unusual delays that, you know, for example, I would have already seen my client by now. His attorney, Kevin Coleman, is representing him in Washington County and now in Nelson County for charges of conspiracy to commit murder and tampering with physical evidence in the Rogers case. For his actual charges, what does that tell you about the case? He was not charged with murder. I'll decline to comment on that just because I don't want to speculate about it, it's pretty obvious, I think, as far as what's implied by that. And I'll let everybody else, uh, you know, make their own inferences. All right. So we're going to come back and discuss Joseph Lawson. Oh, yeah. How this minute. all ties in together. For yeah. Sure. When we sum everything up. A Nelson County grand jury returned a true bill on charges against Joseph Lawson. Conspiracy to commit murder and tampering with physical evidence. According to the indictment, both charges stem from an incident on the 4th of July weekend in 2015 when Crystal went missing. He's been accused of destroying, mutilating, concealing, or removing physical evidence and aiding in the commission of planning a crime that intentionally caused the death of another person. So they have some real evidence here that Crystal's dead. I think that oh, yeah. they must. Yeah. Lawson was scheduled for a pretrial hearing that was supposed to happen in October of 2023. But for some reason, the judge pushed the date of this pretrial hearing to 2024, January 2024. It's unclear why the hearing was moved, but it looks like both the defense and the prosecution agreed with this. So I think I think that Joseph Lawson told the police something about Brooks Houck, right? Because he's arrested before Brooks. He's That's arrested right. before Brooks. Well, shortly after Brooks was arrested. And then on September 27th, Brooks is also arrested and he's charged with murder yeah. and tampering with physical evidence in the case of Crystal Rogers. So we've got Joseph Lawson, who, as far as we know, doesn't have direct ties to Brooks, but his father did some work, work for Brooks and called Brooks the night, like right around midnight that right Crystal around. disappeared. And then allegedly covered for him when Brooks called him in the presence of Detective John Snow. Hey, do you remember what I called you about? Oh, yeah, yeah. actually, I do. You know, so it's all starting to fall into place. Here. And think about it. So we can kind of weigh in it here where with Joseph Lawson as an investigator, if Brooks is your main guy, if Brooks is the one that killed Crystal, right, for the sake of this conversation, allegedly. He he's he's going to go to his de he's going to go to his grave saying he didn't do it because he's mm -hmm. got nothing to gain by admitting to it. He's the last line sure. of defense. Right. But as an investigator, especially when you have multiple people who are involved, multiple people who are connected to this crime, that's a win because not everyone's going to have an equal part. So you want to try to identify the person. I think I've said this phrase before, the person with the least involvement, but the most to lose mm -hmm. or the weak link, if you will. Uh -huh. And and you want to find the person who may have just disposed of a garbage bag, right? Just disposed of a garbage bag. But when you charge them with the same crime, conspiracy to commit murder, which by the way- Well, can, Brooks can, was charged with murder. Murder. But when and, you charge Joseph yeah. with conspiracy to commit murder- You're getting- It, it carries the same sentence. It carries sentence. the same penalty, yeah. You, you can go to prison for the rest of your life for disposing of a bag in a yes. driveway that was still sealing, like was still healing as far as like curing, I should say, not mm -hmm. healing. Yeah. Um, and, and you're going to go to prison for the rest of your life for that? So he's the guy you want to attack. He's the guy you want to bring in and break down and let him know, hey, listen, I know he's, you got your father. Your father's loyal to him. You will. We're going to charge you with first degree, basically first degree murder here. And you're going to go to prison for basically having nothing to do with this. Is that really how your story is going to end? And obviously that person is going to be more inclined to cooperate. And so as you just laid out, they finally start to connect the dots. They finally start to identify a weak link who had very probably minimal involvement. Maybe, maybe he had more. We'll find out. But I mean, at least the type of person he is, he could have had a, a good deal of involvement. And I don't, I don't think he did it. Because he was, because his father's loyal to Brooks, I'm sure he was paid. I'm sure he was compensated I mean, in some way. In the back, on the back end, for sure. Not, not directly, but they can still find out. Did this person, who usually didn't even have a home to live in, was transient, uh, he, going he might from have been place a to place, on a couple of job sites too. Couldn't keep a job. He listed his job as as being a construction there worker, you go. right? He's but, a laborer, <laughs> but he's he's a contractor, so he's right. just contracted out. Did he receive a large sum of money at some point 
that really didn't add up to any substantial work that he did. And they're going to be able to find that out and they're going oh, to they'll, come they'll to him with this. paper trail for sure. Yeah, no, so yeah. they bring him in. He sings like a he sings like a canary, right? He starts telling them what he knows and they're able to connect more dots and based on now what they have from Joseph's statement, he'll probably get a deal, right? Mm-hmm. He'll get a deal when this is yeah. all said and done for his testimony and they're going to go after the big fish, which is going to end up being more Brooks. than likely Brooks and then also and Nick. And Nick, also Nick cuz depending on how that all ties. But they're brothers. So they're not gonna they're not gonna turn on each other. It's gonna be actual evidence, the circumstantial evidence surrounding it, um, where they might even be in a situation where, who knows, maybe they can't connect Nick directly to Crystal's disappearance and death, but they get him on the murder for Tommy Ballard. You know, it could be something like that. But I do think they have a, a mountain of evidence here. And now the fact that there's other people involved, that is music to a detective's ears. Because oh, yeah. if there's only one person who knows, and that's the main guy, he's going to be, a, there's no re, there's no incentive for him to cooperate. But when you have other people who may have involvement, that's, that's, a, that's a huge win for, for law enforcement. And here's the thing. We don't know what Joseph Lawson has. That dude could be like, I don't trust these freaking hawks. Maybe he kept the burner phone that he used to communicate with Brooks or Nick or his father. And he can prove that there was communication around that time, right? Because he's being charged with a crime on a very specific date. So they'd have to, that, that 4th of July weekend, they'd have to have something that showed he did something that weekend, some sort of real evidence in order to charge him with that. So he could have kept something to protect himself, knowing that this day would come, which is another reason why Brooks is an idiot, an idiot. You said they were like the Duttons. Hell no, they're not. They think they are. They think they're this little Bardstown mafia. But in reality, once again, two can keep a secret if one of them is dead. The more people you bring in, the weaker you are. Loose lips sink ships. The more susceptible you are to somebody turning on you because they may be loyal enough to you to get their hands dirty, but they are not loyal enough to you to go to prison for the rest of their lives. While they're in a wheelchair on top of that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. God, it's going to be so good. I cannot wait for this trial. Anyways, so Brooks, he's being held on $10 million bond in the Nelson County Jail. Uh, his lawyers are real pissed about it. <laughs> they, they, they keep trying to get it reduced. His uh, lawyer, Brian Butler, called it unreasonable, punitive, and oppressive, and he filed a motion for Brooks's bail to be lowered to $500,000 with the promise that he wouldn't contact the Ballard family and he would also wear a GPS ankle monitoring device. But Judge Charles Sims, he decided ultimately to keep the bond the same since he was like, listen, we're protecting cooperating witnesses, okay? Maybe you and your family have a tendency to take out people when they're getting too close to the case. We're protecting them. We're also protecting evidence of grand jury recordings, which, you know, I I believe that Brooks's lawyers would have access to by now. And, you know, based on Brooks's financial status, we think he can handle this. If he really wanted to get out, he can afford to get out. So it's not punitive and it's not oppressive. And also, you know, Brooks wants a fair trial, right? He wants a fair trial. So he should go along with this because this is what's fair. And this is going to keep everybody who's going to be a part of this trial on the same page. Um, Now, apparently, (laughs) to take it even further, which shows you like, and I do have to give the Hauk family credit here. They, They are a strong family unit. They protect each other, which I respect to some extent. But there's evidence that members of the Hauk family secretly recorded grand jury proceedings, which, once again, are private. You're not supposed to do that. One recording was allegedly made by Brooks's sister, Rhonda McElvoy. Brooks shows her how to run the recorder, tells her he wants a tape of it. The question is why? To make sure everyone's story is consistent. It's been stated before, the truth will set you free. The problem in this matter is the truth will imprison Brooks Howe. And we're asking your honor. 
That's Shane Young, the special prosecutor assigned to the Crystal Rogers murder case, talking about Brooks Houck and his sister. Grand jury proceedings are secret. That's where regular members of the public chosen to be on a grand jury determine whether someone should face criminal charges. They don't decide whether a defendant is guilty. That's what a jury does. We talked to Terry Gohagan, the Nelson County Commonwealth's attorney. He says he subpoenaed the Houck family within two weeks of Crystal Rogers' disappearance back in 2015 and interviewed members of the Houck family. He says at the time there was no reason to believe they had recorded the grand jury proceedings. Gohagan says when the FBI searched Brooke Houck's mother Rosemary's farm years later, it found the recordings in a jacket in a closet. He says a family took micro recorders into the grand jury room that could be easily hidden in a pocket. Young talked about the recordings on Thursday. The defendant's sister, Rhonda McElvoy Houck, brother Nicholas Houck, mother Rosemary Houck, brother-in-law Alex McElvoy, and Rosemary Houck's live-in boyfriend, Larry Mock, all recorded, secretly brought in recorders and recorded the grand jury. I've been practicing here, Your Honor, for 25 years in this state, and I have yet, ever, heard of anyone recording a grand jury. The other way you look at that is law enforcement, local law enforcement, comes out and says you're the prime suspect and releases evidence and gets you excoriated on podcasts and medias and signs and yards, who in their right mind wouldn't want to know what was being said? Gohagan says that the recordings were discovered in 2015. The Hawks who recorded them could have been charged with contempt of court. It's a misdemeanor with a fine of up to $1,000 and a year in jail. But misdemeanors can only be prosecuted within one year of the crime. So Gohagan says too much time has passed to charge anyone now. By the way, I think he was calling us out podcasts. Dude, it's, it cracks me up because Brian Butler comes on, right? Brooks is lawyer, and he's like, another way to look at this. Yeah. Well, that's one way to look at it. I know it's illegal, and, you know, you shouldn't do it. And if you do do it, it's most likely for nefarious purposes. Mm. But another, because now you're putting people in, in danger, right? Yeah. You're putting people, witnesses who are testifying at the grand jury who are told, you're safe. Say whatever you want. This is a secret. This cannot get out. Mm-hmm. You're putting them in danger, which is another reason why, yeah, Brooks needs to keep his ass behind bars. OK, that's why his bond's so high, because yep. he doesn't follow the rules. He thinks he lives uh, above the rules, outside of the rules. They all dude, his brother, his sister, his sister's husband, his mother, his mother's boyfriend. They all brought in recorders and they're mm -hmm. recording the grand jury proceedings. And then his lawyer's like, another way to look at this is, you, you know, know, I mean, he's being like talked about on podcasts Ugh. and why wouldn't you want to know what's being said about you because you can't dude because you can't we all want to know everybody who's the subject of a grand jury would like to know what's being said about them but you can't you can't That's it's the against point. the law yeah. but now the statute of limitations is up by the time you they know found they, the recorders yeah, yeah. The so tapes. but in rosemary's house in a jacket pocket once again these people are not smart man they're not smart if criminals were smart, they wouldn't get caught. But I'm saying that's why Detective John Snow was like, oh, it's unlikely we'll go back to the farm. Because he was like, yeah, keep your shit at the farm, Hulk family. <laughs> keep it there. <laughs> it's unlikely we'll go back. Wink, wink. <laughs> okay. So these people are kind of like scumbags, right? The, this Hulk family, they're, they're kind of scumbags. They all know what Brooks did. They all know that Nick helped him. Allegedly, this is my speculation. And they're covering. And then now they're implicating themselves in the process. Mm. And they have a lot to lose, this family. That they do. But apparently it doesn't matter. So listen, this is kind of where we're at with this. At this time, Brooks is expected to be back in court in February of 2024, where evidence that has been gathered will be presented and a jury of his peers will decide whether or not Brooke House is truly involved with the disappearance and murder of the mother of his child, Crystal Rogers. And I'm really looking forward to this trial. I'm really looking forward to this trial because just from the things that have been dropped since his arrest, I feel like that's the tip of the iceberg. They yeah, got so much more. Yeah, you twice in this episode. Uh, for it's me, the tip of the iceberg. For, for me, it's uh, to just summarize this because I feel like most people are going to be aware of where we're going with this. Obviously, this is just our opinions. He's innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. 
But on top of everything else we've covered over these last two cases, as far as um, what happened before the incident, what happened during the incident, you also have to think about the phrase consciousness of guilt, right? And what that refers to is a suspect's behavior after the alleged incident. What type of practices do they proceed to carry out following the potential homicide, right? And all the things that Brooks and Nick did after this incident as what the sister did, what the mother, grandmother did, that is a consciousness of guilt. It's an understanding that something has happened and now you're trying to cover your tracks. So that all in totality does not look good for the Hawks family. But I'll Mm-mm. also say you just there's no other suspect because the narrative that was being conveyed by Brooks does not make sense as an investigator. Crystal and Brooks allegedly came home late that evening with Eli. She didn't tell him she was going out. There would be no reason for her to go out early in the morning without telling him. He probably would have known that. We're just to believe that Crystal out of nowhere got up in the middle of the night or didn't go to sleep at all. It got in her car drove down the road and just stopped, pulled her car to the side of the road to get into a car with someone else or was trying to fix something and got picked up by someone. And this is, this is how it came to be. And there's been nothing in the forensic evidence, the digital data to show that Crystal was having communications with another person at that time who could have been picking her up, who could have been a potential suspect. So when they do this case, they will be looking at all the inculpatory evidence that they have against Brooks and anybody else. And they will also be ruling out any potential exculpatory evidence, anything that could say, hey, what about this person? Could they have done it? Could this rule out my client Brooks? Could this rule out my my client Nick? They're going to do both. They're going to give you both scenarios Mm -hmm. so that they're not able, the defense team is not able to create a level of reasonable doubt within one of the jury members, which could potentially get Brooks or Nick or the combination of them off. So I think it's a pretty solid case, although circumstantial, I do think it's pretty solid. And that's our opinions, but we'll we'll see how it plays out. And I'll definitely be following along. Yeah. I mean, I'm like I said, I'm very I'm very excited to uh, see Brooks go to trial and we will do a follow up episode when that happens. We'll do a follow up, a follow up episode about what's revealed during the trial. We'll basically do a a, uh, I don't know, delayed part three. To this. Yeah, we'll cover yeah. it because I'm sure it's going to be a lot. And no, so that's going to be good. We're going to wrap this one up. We don't even know what case we're covering next. We're going to talk about this. We've thrown out a couple ideas already. We will let you know. So we can't even spoil it because we don't know. Mm-hmm. But just a kind of reminder, Criminal Coffee, local delivery, now available, Rao and Mass. If you have a cafe in the area, let them know about us. Give them the information. Send them to the website. Get their contact information. Email us. Let us know if they're interested. We'll do the rest. And if something comes from it, We'll take care of you. And then most importantly, Preble Penny, November 17th, when there's a time, if there's a time, we'll let you know. We will hop on live. We will watch it live with you so we can all experience that together as they announce the information around this case. Because each and every one of you who've contributed to Criminal Coffee have now also contributed to this case. So it's going to be great. Uh, Looking forward to it. Uh, Any final words, Stephanie? No, uh, I am. I'm definitely really happy with how this this case is going now and i'm really looking forward to the preble penny announcement even though i don't know what it's going to say but i'm yep. looking forward to everybody's yeah, we've reaction. been involved with it it's been yep. trying at times but it's yep. good it has been trying <laughs> it's been fr- i've been <laughs> stephanie can attest to this i've been on this one now she's been she's been seeing the email chains mm. and then he me. calls me and he's like Rah. yeah i'm like what's going on here you know but <laughs> anyways we're there yeah, we're there okay. and we're just getting started. We've got more cases to come. Everyone, stay safe out there. Have a good night. We will see you next week. Bye.